Every step forward in faith is a little bit of a step away from self-centeredness, a little bit of a step away from fulfilling our own desires. This morning, we end a, a series along with the Wesley Challenge look at some, looking at some of the things that God speaks into our lives. And today we're going to do that by turning to the book of Jonah, which is in the Old Testament. We're going to look at actually Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now you can follow along in your pew Bible, your personal Bible, or it's printed for your convenience there in your bulletin. Let us hear from Jonah and to hear what happens when people decide to take God seriously. I invite you to hear these words. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covering himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, give us humble, teachable, and trusting hearts that we may receive what you have revealed to us and do as you have commanded us to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You might be familiar with the story of Jonah. Uh, usually we remember Jonah for what happened to him, not for what his job was. We remember Jonah as the man who was swallowed up by the big fish, right? Right? And he spent all that time in the belly of the fish. Sometimes we hear whale, but the scripture says fish. And so he spent all that time in the belly of the fish, and then the fish spit him out, and he swam towards land. And this is where we pick up the story, because God spoke to him a second time, saying, seriously, I do want you to go to Nineveh. Now, you see, what happened was is that God said in chapter 1, Jonah, go to Nineveh. And Nineveh was a place that was full of people that Jonah hated. He hated them. He hated them. He didn't want to go there. He kind of hoped, I think, maybe, that by not going there, it would hasten God's response and God would destroy the city. But God wanted Jonah to go there and to proclaim to them that if they did not change their ways, bad things would come their way. Jonah didn't want to do this. And so he got in a boat and went off. And we know the rest of the story. He was going away from God's will. God caused this situation to happen with the big fish. And then we hear him on the shore being talked to by God, saying to him a second time, now go to Nineveh. He goes to Nineveh. Jonah does. And he proclaims what has been said. Now, archaeologists have found some of the area that they believe is Nineveh. It's very close to the city of Mosul in Iraq. And they have found these ruins, and they can say 
that it likely would have taken Jonah three days not to walk across the city side to side, but to walk through every neighborhood in that city. To walk through every neighborhood and to proclaim this word to the people would have taken him three days. And as he went around and around, people responded by putting on sackcloth. If you've never touched sackcloth before, it's very, very rough and itchy. It's not the kind of thing you would want to put on as your clothes. It was put on as a sign of humility, that they were sorry for what they did. They were putting it on to show that God was greater than them, and they were sorry. Not only that, they, they fasted. They did not eat. They tried to show God that they were sorry by their actions. Not only did they do this, it worked its way up to the king, one of the most powerful people in the region at this time. And he did the same thing. He put on sackcloth. He said he was sorry. He did not eat. And not only did he command all the people in Nineveh, his people, to do the same thing, he even said the animals should do it. The flock should not eat. The herd should not eat. All of these things were done to try to show God that they were sorry. The main points about the book of Jonah are that God is the God of all people. Not just the God of Israel, not just the God of Judah, not just the God of these people, but God is the God of everyone, including the people of Nineveh. So God's establishing his relationship with the people of Nineveh. The other thing, the other main point from the book of Jonah is that God is a God of steadfast love and forgiveness, that God is a God of grace and mercy. Why is this a big theme? Because Jonah goes and says to the people of Nineveh, if you do not repent, calamity will come your way, and they repent, and God changes his mind, and God forgives them. And what does Noah do? <laughs> Noah, Jonah. <laughs> Noah got on an ark. <laughs> Jonah got in a fish. Very different. Okay. I'm glad I caught that before it went on YouTube. And my seminary professors would be so, so, so disappointed. Uh, Jonah, Jonah pouted. Jonah went away from the city, sat out in the middle of nowhere, and pouted. And God came to him and said, why are you doing this? And Jonah said, I knew you were a God of forgiveness and mercy. I knew you'd forgive them. And he's mad about it. Why? Because the Ninevites were his enemies. God tries to explain to pouting Jonah that yes, God is a God of forgiveness. God is a God of the whole world. God is the Father of all of us, whether we're from Israel or from Nineveh. And God reminds Jonah right there at the end of the book that there were 120,000 people in that city. It took three days to walk all through that neighborhood of Nineveh, that great city. There were 120,000 people. God cared about those people. That's who God is. That's how the story ends. It just ends right there. Jonah is out there pouting still under the hot sun, and God reminds him that he loves the people of Nineveh too, all 120,000 people. And then it ends. That's it. That's the end of Jonah. That's the end of the story. We don't really know what happens after that. But that's not the end of the story of the Ninevites. And that was one thing that I've wondered about. And I finally spent some time doing some research about what we find out about the people of Nineveh. Because at the end of this book, things seem to be pretty good for them, right? They have dodged a bullet. They have avoided calamity. They listened to Jonah, what he was saying about God. Not only they, the people, but the king as well. They repented. They said they were sorry. And then God changes his mind and the story ends. Unfortunately for the people of Nineveh, the story continues. You see, about a hundred years after we think the time of Jonah, or at least the time in which this book was supposed to happen, Nineveh and its people slip back into their old ways. 
There's another book in the Old Testament called Nahum. And in Nahum, we find out that the people of Nineveh went back to their violent ways. They went back to plundering other cities. They went back to uh, taking uh, power over other people, uh, having dominion over them, and treating them poorly, even torturing some of them. They went back to their greedy ways. They went back to their old ways before they got dressed in sackcloth and fasted. And this minor prophet, Nahum, says that God is going to come back. God is going to do something because you have turned away from God yet again. And what we know is is that eventually they do not do this. And again, a little over 100 years after the time of Jonah, the city of Nineveh was taken over by a, a conglomeration of other states at the time. These other empires, you know, bound together and took over the city of Nineveh and it fell. And so a hundred years, a little over a hundred years later, the city of Nineveh meets its end. It makes you wonder about that story from Jonah. Why did they listen the first time? Why did they listen to God the first time? Why did they get dressed in sackcloth and fast? Was it out of fear? Was it that they really took God seriously the first time? And when God relented and forgave them and allowed them to continue, they went back to their old ways and nothing happened to them. There was no consequence. And so they went right back thinking that they would not see what God was bringing to them. We may not know. Out of fear, it seems, they repented and they tried to ask for forgiveness. But as soon as the immediate threat was over, they seemed to slip back into their old ways. That seems to be like us sometimes, doesn't it? When we know we have crossed the line or we know we have done something wrong, if we don't meet a consequence, it's real easy for us to slip back into those old sinful ways. Just like the people of Nineveh. They did not hear or see or feel the sting of the consequence, and they went right back to their old ways. I was a youth pastor for many, many years before I joined the staff here as one of your pastors. And as a youth pastor, you know you go on a lot of trips with teenagers. And it's usually a lot of fun because they're so full of life and they so are eager to help others and to learn for the most part. But one of the things I often dread whenever I would go on a mission trip or retreat was bedtime. It was bedtime. Because they were so excited about being with their friends, they were so excited about being away from home, that it was hard for them to, you know, turn everything off. To calm down and to get tired. And I was responsible for trying to get them to bed, not only because they needed the rest, but because I had a bunch of volunteers, these adults who had taken off from work or taken off a weekend to come, and if I did not help them get their rest and have good coffee in the morning, they would never come back on a mission trip with me. And so I would come into the room and say to these young people, it's time to go to bed, I'm going to turn off the light, and in 15 minutes I want it to be quiet. So I would turn off the light, I'd go back and I would talk to some of the adults. We would lay down. 15 minutes later, all we hear is giggling and loud whispering. You know what loud whispering is. You think nobody else can hear you, but everybody can hear you. My son does this from time to time. He will try to tell a secret to us, but he doesn't put his hand in the right place. Like you're supposed to block other people, but he sort of amplifies his whisper by putting it on the other side. Mommy, daddy isn't funny. Um, that's what's going on. And I, I would finally sort of have enough because the, the noise was not dying down, but I would come into the room, and as soon as they heard my footsteps, everybody started going, shh, <laughs> and then it got real quiet. And I would stand in there for a minute, and I would say, seriously, it's time to go to bed. And of course, somebody was a smart aleck, and they would go, (laughs) start snoring. And then I would finally go, and they were smart. They would let me get to my bed and lay my head. As soon as my head hit the pillow, 
They would be back to giggling. They'd be back to whispering. As soon as the immediate threat was out of the room, it was real easy to go back to breaking the rules for those young people. And I understand. I understand. They were excited. They, they were friends. And I love that, that they were excited to be with one another. But at the same time, we knew what was best for them. Because whatever was best for them would be really good for us as parents and volunteers. But you see, as soon as the immediate threat left the room, they went right back to their old ways. How do we deal with this? How do we deal with doing what is right? How do we deal with doing what is necessary? How do we deal, how do we deal with doing the right thing when we have a God of steadfast love and mercy? How do we deal with this? A God who allows us the opportunity to fail, who works with us through the Holy Spirit to pick us back up and help us try again? Because God wants the best for us. God wants us to repent and to confess so that we can be His people. The point of God's sending Jonah to tell the people of Nineveh that they were out of step, out of line, and out of harmony with God was not just to get them to repent and to say they were sorry. That's not what God's looking for. God is not a God looking for power or notoriety. God is a God who's looking for relationship. So what God wanted from Jonah was to give the message so that they would repent and hopefully then begin to establish a relationship with God. The repentance was the first step. Jonah was the messenger of step number one to help the people turn from their bad ways. Step two and three and four and all of those were coming. But as soon as that immediate threat of consequence went away, the Ninevites fell away and did not take step two or three or four or whatever it was. Friends, God desires us to confess and to repent, to say we're sorry, to, to realize that we are out of line, out of step, and out of harmony with God. But God does not want us to do that so that we feel pitifully about ourselves, even though we do have a lot to be sorry for. God does this to show us that we need God, that our lives will be better with God, that God has a purpose and a plan for us that lies beyond step one. What God wants for us is to take the next faithful step, the next faithful step. The Ninevites took step one, but what comes after confession? What comes after repentance? The next step is where we faithfully respond to the God of steadfast love and forgiveness. He forgives us for a reason. Who forgives us for a purpose. Who forgives us so that we will live with God and for God. Josh Daffern is, a, is an author and he said a couple of things about taking the next faithful step in our lives with God. The very first thing that Josh says is, is that every step of faith requires dying to ourself. Dying to ourself. Every step forward in faith is a little bit of a step away from self-centeredness. A little bit of a step away from fulfilling our own desires. See, when we take a step of faith, we're taking a step in the uh, way of Jesus, in the direction of God, and it's in the direction of God's will. So when we're taking a step in this direction, when we're taking a step forward with God, we're taking a step away from the old ways, the selfish ways, the prideful ways, the greed way of life. What happens for us is that we often, like that old song, take two steps forward and one step back. We go in that direction, but then we slip back a little bit. God, the God of steadfast love and forgiveness, is ready to forgive us for that back step and is calling us forward two steps and more. It requires a dying to self. It means turning away from that which is selfish, that is hurtful to ourselves or others, 
turning away from that, putting that away, it means dying to self a bit. Now, we don't mean literally dying ourselves, but we do mean putting away some of those things that are not in harmony with God's will, putting them away, letting them die. This is a painful process. It's not an easy process. Just like any death or any ending, it is difficult. It is not instantaneous. It is a process. We are called to put away these old ways, not relapse back into them. The other thing that Josh Daffern tells us is that every step should deepen our trust in God. I love the fact that he calls this a step of faith. It's a step of faith because we're stepping out into the unknown. Sometimes we take a step out in vulnerability because we don't know how we'll be responded to. We don't know what will happen to us if we take that next faithful step. And so in a way, we are out not on our own, but we are out in a place that is unknown. And the only person we can really trust in is God and the community of faith that helps us take these steps, the church, our friends in faith, who encourage us as we take these steps. And so friends, as we learn from Jonah, who took that step of going out to go preach to the Ninevites, we learned that he did not really do so willingly, did he? And he really didn't do so in the right spirit. But God used him anyway. That's not the way God wants us to follow his will. God wants us to step out in faith, trusting in God, so that we can be the kind of people who look to God for everything for inspiration, for encouragement, for power, and for the very things that we need, the very words that we have to say, the very things that we are supposed to do. Step of faith is just that. It's a step into the unknown, and we're called to trust in God each and every step of the way. Taking the next faithful step is about growing in Christ. It's about growing in our relationship with God. Yes, repentance and confession, saying you're sorry, all of those things are beautiful and wonderful, and we need to do that more often, just like we did early in the service when we prayed the prayer of confession today. But there are faithful steps after that, the steps where we are reconciled to God, the steps where we are put back together again, the steps where we are empowered to do something or to learn something or to grow in some way or to be a witness to Christ in the world around us. Those are the next faithful steps. The Ninevites, yes, they took the first step, but they neglected to take the other steps. Let us not be like them. Let us not be like those who slip back or relapse into their old ways. We have got to focus on what it means for us to take the next faithful step. So you, in your relationship with God, have got to figure out what your next faithful step is. And this requires devotion and study and prayer like we talked about last week. But it also requires getting to know yourself a little bit better. Not only spending time developing a relationship with God, but it means developing a relationship with your own self, understanding who you are, how you're knit together, What are your shortcomings, your areas of growth, and where are your strengths? Later on in the spring, our church is going to offer a program, if you're interested, in helping you develop uh, an understanding of your strengths, to understand where you're gifted, to understand maybe how God has wired you for ministry and service in the church. Some of you may already know these things. You may be ready to go ahead and take that next faithful step. Some of you may not be really at the point at which you know who you are. You know whose you are. You know you belong to God, but you don't really understand yet how you are knit together. And so a program like this is a great first step in helping you learn about this. And that will be coming sometime around the end of March or the beginning of April. So be looking for that in your bulletin and newsletter. But the other thing you can do friends, is to ask the people around you, the people closest to you, the people that you trust, the people that you are most comfortable being vulnerable with, 
and ask for their opinions about where your weaknesses are, where your areas of growth are, where your strengths are. And maybe through those very places of strength or weakness, God will show you what the next faithful step is. Whether it's to step out in your area of strength, your area of spiritual gift, or maybe it's a step forward in an area of weakness where you might need to admit that you need to improve. Finally, you might need to ask yourself the question that we all have to unfortunately face. That Jonah and the Ninevites were supposed to face as well. What inside of you has to die so that you can take the next faithful step? For Jonah, I think it's pretty clear. For Jonah, what had to die in him was hate towards enemies. He could not move forward with God. He could not move beyond his role as messenger until he could put that hate away. God tried to tell him, there were 120,000 people in that city. Do you not think I love them too? Friends, if we commit the sin of Jonah, if we allow hate to be in our lives over a group of people or to even one person that we hate, that is not good. That is obvious, obviously a place that needs to die in our hearts so that God can help us move forward. If you're part of the Wesley Challenge or the Life Track Spiritual Devotion that are in your bulletin, you will notice that eventually this week we will get to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a favorite passage for weddings. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not arrogant or rude or boastful. Love. Jonah was called to be a messenger of love. A God of steadfast love and forgiveness speaking out to these Ninevites saying he loves them. He doesn't want them to destroy themselves with the way they're living. But the hate in Jonah's heart would not allow him to fully be able to do that. He helped lead them at least to repentance. But then he left the city and pouted. Hate in Jonah's heart had to die so that he could take the next faithful step. For each and every one of us, we've got to take that moment, that time, to assess ourselves, to assess our fragility, to assess our growth areas and weaknesses, and even our strengths, yes. But we've got to figure out what needs to die in our heart so that we can take the next faithful step with God. Because God is calling us to take the step. He's calling you. He's calling me. May we be brave enough to put one foot in front of the other. Amen. And amen.